so as we gather back together, um, I think I'm, I'm going to be sitting in for Professor Teresa Polovi, who is under the we weather uh, today. She just uh, arrived back from Kazakhstan uh, and was not able to be with us for the second panel. So I'm going to be sitting in, in her stead. And uh, this panel is entitled Conceiving and Crafting Translations. So as we, we began with some of the more uh, sociological aspects of translation and interpreting and some of the kind of social justice aspects of it, um, the, some of the procedural concerns that go along with uh, translating. Uh, this panel is primarily about craft and conception, which is very exciting to have an entire uh, discussion around how to conceive translations, how to craft them, all of the kind of nitty gritty steps that go into making a translation come alive. And for any of us who are working translators, this is one of the, uh, one of our day to day kind of issues that we always uh, confront. So I'd like to give our, our panelists an opportunity to share some of their experiences with conceiving and crafting translations. Uh, but that, that's a, a question that we'll come to after each of them uh, get a chance to introduce their current projects and uh, share some of their experiences with you. So uh, I'd like to start with uh, Beppe Cavatorta, professor of Italian here at the University of Arizona. So. Thank you very much, David. Well, uh, I have worked on uh, many translation projects since I came to the United States. It's on. Hello? No? Well, not my. That's okay. So I was saying that I work on many translation projects since I came to the United States in 1995, both uh, from Italian into English and English into Italian. I would like to remember, I mean, to rem uh, I, I would like to uh, go back to my first project ever uh, that came about because of a request by an Italian literary journal for a long, uh, to translate a long experimental poem written, written by Lou Reed, yeah, the walk on the white side, Lou Reed, titled The Murder Mystery. Its in incipit can provide a good idea of uh, my up upcoming battle. This is the beginning of the poem. Relent and observe an inverse and perverse and reverse the inverse of perverse and reverse and reverse and reverse and reverse and reverse and chop it and pluck it and cut it and spit it, sew it to joy on the edge of a cyclop and spin it to rage on, a, on the edge of a cylindrical minute. Uh, my main scholarly interest is in experimental language, both in poetry and prose, and being able to render in another language the sound effects of the original, along with its obscure content, gave me the same satisfaction, I believe, since I'm not a poet, a poet feels after finishing one of his poems. After that, translating has always been part of my scholarly work, and I kind of remember a period of time I was not working on some translation project. I definitely feel more comfortable when translating from English into Italian. And in addition to Lou Reed, um, I've published translation of several American poets, among which Paul Carroll, Kenneth Irby, Bernadette Mayer, David Lemon, and Stan Rice. On the other hand, I have to say, my main translation projects uh, in order to make more Italian literature available to the Anglophile world, have been from Italian into English. The most ambitious, ambitious one was the translation of what can be called the most experimental, the most language conscious novel in Italian literature, that is The Portal by Adriano Spatola. A novel which defies any accepted notion of what a novel should be, where its main character is born and dies several times, where he is just, and I quote, a body made up, of the, made up and living solely by the unique force of adhesion of the letters that make up his name. Where punctuation, rather than playing the role 
of explanatory clarifier serves as the bearer of the rhythmic scansions, where it is possible to observe an anti-deterministic evolution caused by the shifting of interest toward language rather than the, to the denouement, denouement of the plot. A plot that Spatola calls the catalog of mannerisms of rapes. Just to give you an example of the problems encountered in the translation, I chose a passage in which both words hybridization and sound play a major role. In this passage, we see Guglielmo, the main character, kneeling and praying. His prayer in Italian reads, Diesu, Diesu, proteggici tu. Proteggici tu translates easily into protect us. Where the name invoke, invoked, Diesu, is the hybridization of the Italian word Dio, God, and Gesù, Jesus. The Italian is characterized also by the sound effect created by the rhyme. Gesù, Gesù, proteggici tu. This is the best I could come up with in order to save both effects. Uh, Guglielmo, with his charred face and hard-boiled eyes, Guglielmo calm in the mud like a corpse awaiting the sleeper car at the train station that will take him back to where he was born where he has lived, where he has had the purest joys of his life. Guglielmo on his knees, Guglielmo, hands together, praying, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, deliver us from evil. I'm sure that, uh, I mean, many of us uh, may do something, I mean, a better job than this, but this, uh, again, a translation, I believe is not ever a final, this is my translation of the work, uh, a lot of possible different translation can be given when sounds, when experimental language is involved. Mm. Uh, it took a long time to finalize the translation, as you can imagine, but uh, it, it was definitely worth it. It generated a great interest in the United States, and experts of it have been reissued in some of the most important literary journals, both in the United States and in Canada. I have several projects on the table right now, some of which are about to be finalized, and others just in my head. One of them involves an author from Sardinia whose writing can be described as a hybridization between standard Italian and Sardinian. Not a dialect, as you know, but a Romance language itself. Uh, like many of the authors I worked on, Atsen is one of those writers that is not easily labeled unflinching in his estrangement from literary cliques, a loner, and as often happens, almost forgotten, because his work, with no support from the literary establishment, is easily cast aside. Before giving the word back to my colleagues, I would like to conclude with one last text I translated, in, uh, I translated in which Atheni openly declares war, one that is fighting alone, outside any group of school, without the need, or most importantly, the desire to be part of one of the many gangs that often gain ground to the strength of the group itself, praising one another without having, having anything new to say. Atseni does it in his own way, creating, I believe, one of the most beautiful oxymora of the last few years, the banda individuale, that is the one-man gang. He writes, life is a war for gangs. No news there and nothing wrong with it. It becomes a condemnation if they forbid you to bring forth for love and worship of the leaders the solitary war to be your own one-man gang. And again, this is maybe also a situation in which we who translate uh, find ourselves uh, when uh, we are looking into a publisher to uh, accept our work and uh, print it. Thank you. How's this one working? That was great. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Wendy Burke, and I'm a poet and a literary translator. And I work at the University of Arizona Poetry Center. I'm the librarian there. Um, I actually share 
a lot of um, the concerns I'd say that the first group of panelists brought up. I got my start um, a very long time ago as a volunteer interpreter in a hospital. Um, and that experience has stayed with me as I've moved towards literary translation. Uh, speaking of the word volunteer, um, when you take the word poetry and the word translation and you put them together, a lot of times you end up doing volunteer work. Um, <laughs> um, and with one important exception in my life, which has made my current project possible, um, I find that my work as a translator um, and as a poet takes place um, outside of my um, nine to five job. And while I think of it as a profession very much, um, I recognize that it's a largely um, unpaid profession for those of us who translate poetry, uh, which I think is interesting for our discussion. Um, I've worked with the poet Teddy Lopez Mills since 2004. Um, she's a contemporary poet from Mexico City and she's also an essayist, an editor, and she herself is a translator of English, US, and French work, largely poetry. I actually met her here in Tucson when she was reading for the University of Arizona Poetry Center, and I had the chance to translate a selection of her works for the occasion of her reading. Uh, since then, I've translated work from nearly all of her books, um, except the first one and the most recent one all of her books of poetry. And we work very closely together in this process, which is especially nice because she herself is a translator whose experience far outstrips mine. Um, I received a 2013 National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship in translation to translate Teddy Lopez Mills's eighth book, Contra Corriente. Um, so this is the very important exception to my um, largely volunteer career, um, for which I really want to thank the NEA. Um, Contra Corriente was published in 2008, and for me, it's uh, Teddy Lopez Mills' most difficult book. It consists of poems with extremely long lines, and each poem is one single long sentence that is brought together with commas, and then there's a period at the end, and a few colons and semicolons in the middle but each poem is one long sentence that is lettered after the letters of the alphabet. Uh, this form evokes the central trope of the book, which is that of a river. Um, it's an urban river, however, and it carries along uh, all kinds of debris, trash, as well as treasure, I'd say. Um, this is also personal debris, um, history, memory, fragments of the self, fragments of literature. Um, and it's also a physical, river um, that is impacted by the load of trash, the oil, the um, metal, the plastic bags that are carried along with it. When I started translating as a student, this was about 20 years ago, um, and I was told that, well, you should, you should try translating. It will make you a better student of Spanish, which is my second language. Um, and then a few years later, I started studying creative writing. Um, and I was often told that uh, translation would make me a stronger writer and a poet. You should translate because it will strengthen um, your own writing, too. Um, and these are both true. But I would say that the strongest benefit, or one of the two strongest benefits of translation for me is making me a better reader. Um, translation helps me to slow down and pay attention and to read deeply um, like very little else does um, in the very busy lives that I'm sure we all have in common. The other major benefit is to teach me how much I have to learn. And maybe that's just as important. I feel that with every poem that I translate of Teddy Lopez Mills's I realize how much help I need um, in every way. And surely that's a benefit to me as a scholar and also as a person. Um, I know that one of the topics that we'll talk about later today is um, collaboration on this panel. And I think that um, that notion of interdependence, um, of never having all of the pieces of the puzzle, has been 
enormously interesting and beneficial to me. Um, my name is Phil Gabriel. Can you hear me? Is this working okay? All right. Um, and I don't know, I always lug around these books. Um, they're for sale out of the back of my car afterwards. But um, <laughs> uh, recent projects that I have, I just like the, the materiality of books sometimes. Um, one was, this one is called, uh, in English, 1Q84 by a writer that I've been working with now for 25 years, uh, Haruki Murakami. And this book was uh, translated, or rather written in Japanese um, in three volumes. And the publishing history is different from what it was in the United States. Um, Murakami has done this twice, where he publishes two volumes, actually pretty massive volumes, this is one and two, in Japan at the same time. And then people are not sure if the story is over. And critics write articles saying, well, I think it's over, but he sort of leaves it hanging, which he likes to do. And then exactly a year later, he publishes a third volume to, to wind up the story. And I ended up doing volume three of this, of this book. But in English, it's published, um, I mean, there are many things that are different about it. It's published in one volume, all at once. Uh, in England, they tried to be a little tricky about it and publish it, uh, they published book one and book two separately, and then a week later, they published book three. Not a year later, but a week later. So it was kind of a nod to that. But as my co-translator, Jay Rubin, said, the, the title itself already is hard to translate. Um, some people are reading this in English as if it's describing somebody who's not very bright. They read it as IQ84. It's 1Q84, but the Q in Japanese already is not translatable or is difficult because the, it's a homonym for Q, which is 9 in Japanese. So each Q, Hachi Yon, Q meaning, so it's 1984, right? Anyway, so we're already losing or having difficulties there with, uh, with translation. And my other project, um, a recent book was, was this one. It's called Villain in Japanese, uh, Akunin in, Jap in uh, I'm sorry, in Villain in English and Akunin in Japanese. It was a, uh, won by a very big uh, Japanese uh, novelist called Yoshida Shuichi and Somebody commented on how the, I don't know if you can see the design, this guy, Chip Kidd, who does all the designs for this company, he's a, he's a big designer. Um, they said, can you see this? This is a, um, supposed to be a gun made out of human bones, like a skull and bones and things like that. And there's actually, someone pointed out that yes, there is a murder in this book, but there's no bones and there's no gun. So, did this, guy read, did this guy read the book? We're not sure. But uh, anyway, that's the, <laughs> it's an interesting design. Kind of a, kind of a murder mystery. And um, I'm just finishing up a third book, which has an easy title to translate, and they even give you the English here, but a kind of scary title, Genocide. This is the way it's written in, in Japanese, but it's just pronounced genocide. And, I, I like to, uh, I mean, I've done Murakami Haruki for, Haruki Murakami for um, many, many years, and I like to keep up with his work and translate that pretty regularly. But I'm also looking out for different writers, new writers. It's one of the joys I find in translation is to take somebody who maybe is pretty well known in Japan, but is just totally unknown here, and try to weave my way through the the tracks of agents and publishers and editors to finally get an agreement and get it out in English. Sometimes what happens is this actually very great book, Villain in, in Japan, sold two million copies, made into a great movie, and, and uh, it just was not marketed here and they just sort of let it die. And I mean, I went to bookstores and I couldn't even find it. and It was kind of sad after all that work, right? But uh, there's always Britain. Britain, um, <laughs> they publish simultaneous versions of it with different covers. And so I was talking to the editor here, and she said, well, it hasn't done that well here. And um, 
but you know, in England, um, it sold 25,000 copies in one month. And I said, well, wow, how is that possible? And it just turned out that, that um, a chain, uh, something equivalent to Target, I guess, had picked it up for its book section. So all throughout England it had, so they'd sold it in, this, in the sense of the books being um, on the shelves, not necessarily sold to, to people. But there was interest in it, there was more interest in it. So drumming up interest, marketing, getting the books chosen and published, uh, how are they chosen, which authors make it, which don't, all of these are, are big issues. Uh, one person who, uh, in, in our field, in Japanese modern literature, about 20 years ago wrote that um, in America there is an unlimited uh, consumer desire for Japanese products, but there is a quota every generation of imports in literature may be limited to two at most Japanese writers. That means that only two or three actually break through and become not household names, but they become recognized, they become regularly published and reviewed. And so um, in my generation, it's, it's definitely uh, Haruki, Haruki Murakami, this, this writer, has, uh, has achieved that. And he has a new book coming out. Um, working with him is becoming a little bit like working for a spy organization in the sense that uh, I received the uh, galley proofs, the first galley proofs back in December and was told not to reveal that there is a book in existence that's going to be coming out in Japanese. Um, then they said wait for the announcement in Japan that the book actually exists before mentioning that. So people around here were asking, what are you doing? And I'd say, well, <laughs> I can't, I'd love to tell you. But. And, um, and then they announced that the book exists, and then they announced that the book has a title, and they announced what the title was. So that's where we are right now. But yesterday somebody asked me, well, what's the book about? And I said, April 12th, it's published in Japan, and then everybody will know. But they, I don't know why they do this, just to build anticipation, I guess, in Japan. But anticipation is building in America for his, for his work. He's really become a, a well-known writer here. And what I'm, what really gets me most excited is to see, for example, in my, in my graduate, um, well, mixed graduate and undergraduate class, uh, MFA students coming in who, to take a class of, uh, uh, on Murakami, they don't really know much about Japanese literature. Maybe they couldn't even name any other Japanese writers, but at least one has broken through that barrier and has become more than just a niche foreign writer, but has become somebody that, that people who love literature are aware of and are, and are reading. And to have played a little role in, in helping that happen is, is a, to me, is a very happy thing. So that's all. Uh, thanks everyone so much. I think we're really in the thick of it in terms of the, the next topic being collaboration. Uh, Wendy's reminder that every, every poem she translates reminds her how much help she needs. Um, that's, a, that's a beautiful thought. I think uh, we, we had a literary master class with uh, Professor Ar Aron Aji, who's uh, in the house somewhere, I think. Here. Yes, oh, Aron. Wonderful. Anyway, so uh, one thing that he mentioned was this concept that each, uh, that a source language, that there's no source language target language as much as there is a host language and a guest language. I think that's the, uh, and that those languages need to collaborate with one another in the process of translating. So um, we have, I remember my earliest image of a translator was of a 74 year old woman on a high backed couch alone in her apartment smoking a cigarette and having kind of food delivered to her when she was able to take a 15 minute break from translating. Um, so that kind of vision of the solitary translator and of course uh, what, what our guests have uh, demonstrated very clearly is that there's a great deal of very intricate uh, collaboration that goes into producing and conceiving these works. Uh, so maybe uh, uh, Phil mentioned espionage almost, you know, the co collaborating with the non-existent, uh, non-released book. Um, so, you know, I wonder if you could, yeah, conspirator, right. So what are some other modes of collaboration that come up in your, 
in your work, uh, whether it's multidisciplinary or working with authors or working with co-translators, and what could you share about those experiences? Okay. Well, uh, in, since I work on uh, most of the time, let's say, on living poets, uh, it has come about that I had the possibility to work uh, with them. And I would say that sometimes it is a blast, but sometimes it's also a huge problem, especially when the poet maybe doesn't know very well uh, the language which he's translated in. And uh, you begin uh, uh, fights on little things that uh, the translator cannot accommodate at the very end, unless uh, he wants to change completely what was the original work. Uh, Besides collaborating with Odor, I, be, I believe that for me it's very important to collaborate with people that uh, has uh, a clear and uh, precise feeling of English. Uh, after, I mean, I completed the translation, I mean, always uh, I have, I mean, I'm lucky to be friends with a lot of American poets and with translator who actually works uh, and know Italian. So, I mean, before publishing anything, I feel the need to send them there and signal the problem, the signal when maybe there is too much Italian into my English uh, in order to perfect what it has been done. And I would like just to say one more thing. It is very important. I mean, I think that collaboration is extremely important and translation is really important. And I use that in my class. Uh, I teach a class on the Italian resistance in which one of the projects for the student is to uh, translate a short stories uh, uh, that we read together. After they do their own work, I put them together and uh, uh, they have to negotiate at the very end uh, with their own translation to come up what what is the best translation possible using their translation this makes the, this i would uh, definitely agree it makes them better reader they will uh, they are able to uh, get a better grasp of the language and uh, uh, sometimes it brings uh, uh, very good things also for the instructor. My last translation that was published is actually a project that I did with one of my undergraduate students that was here before, but I don't see her anymore, an undergraduate student, Brenna Ward, and uh, we worked together for a whole year on a long poem that was just recently published. And it was uh, great for me to hear what she felt, what she uh, was able to take out of the poem, and I hope it was great for her to listen to my input. And the final work, I think it was, a, at the end, a good one. Well, I had a kind of interesting first uh, experience with this, this new book, 1Q84, which was the first time that I translated a novel with another translator. And People ask us how closely we worked. Um, we didn't, really, and I feel sorry for the editor <laughs> because um, until the very end, we just did our own thing separately. We're very good friends, but we were so busy just doing our parts of the, of the translation, and there was some pressure to get it done fairly quickly. And um, the editor at one point said that she wished that she had two brains because she was kind of going crazy trying to take his version of the story, parts one and two, and then my version of part three, which were done, as I said, kind of separately, and, and put them together. So she sent off this master list of, of words that we had, word choices that were different, and they're just, you know, some banal ones, like I think I chose veranda and he chose balcony to describe the, throughout the story. And so all those things had to be reconciled. But we got to the point, fortunately, like you say, working with uh, living writers, um, my experience has mostly been pretty positive. They've, they've been very generous with their time. And uh, Murakami himself is a translator uh, of American literature, so I think that really helps that he knows the um, ins and outs of translation and uh, is very sympathetic to the translator. So there were uh, times toward the end where we sort of dug in our heels on our word choice 
the other translator and myself. Um, there was, and, and, and then we had to consult the author and get his, him to be the referee, really, for that. There was just one that I remember that was, um, it's bozo atama in Japanese, which basically means that you, your hair is cut very, very short, like a priest, like a Buddhist priest. And I had an image of the guy as kind of scary and a right-wing uh, guard type for a cult, is what he was, and I, I called him uh, Skinhead. He, he, was, he had a nickname, Bozo Atama, and so I called him Skinhead throughout, and my fellow translator had gone with Buzzcut. And um, so we asked the author, because we both liked our own version, and the author said, well, I was thinking more of a military, militaristic image for this guy. And so I think Buzzcut maybe works okay. And since he was a translator himself and I think had given it some thought, we, we decided to go with that. So there were, there were lots of little things like that. But you, you really learn. It goes back and forth if you're doing, if there are two translators, it's, I learn a lot from the other translator and admire some of the choices that he makes and hopefully he, it, it worked the other way too. Yeah. But the editor has a tough time in, in some project like that. And, and in the hardbound, there were still some uh, mistakes and things that, that got by her. And they were, I just got the paper back and I hope they're corrected in the paperback. <laughs> so like Japanese doesn't have uh, singular and plural often. And so there was a major figure who spoke of, a religious cult leader who spoke of hearing um, koe, which could mean voice or voices. And um, I translated it as voice, and the other translator did it as voices. And I'm almost afraid to look in the paperback to see whether she, <laughs> she promised she was going to correct those. <laughs> but we had that major difference of sort of a view of, of this, uh, this cult leader and his religious views. But that's the, sort of the major experience I've had in collaborating. I was very interested to hear that you translate both ways, from English into Italian and Italian into English. And uh, so you're having about equal experience with that or? Well, again, I think that it's much easier for me to translate from English into Italian. Into Italian. Because I mean, I don't know, I have the feeling of the rhythm of everything that uh, would be involved in an Italian poem. When I go into the English again, I need to have somebody to tell me you are doing the right thing before I publish anything. Well, one way or another, we always need native speakers as collaborators, I think. I mean, I'm not confident enough to send out a translation without asking all my question marks in the text to go back with a native speaker and, and double check, or maybe multiple native speakers. Yeah. Well, like both of you, um, I work with a, a living writer, and so I also have the opportunity to um, communicate frequently and collaborate with Teddy Lopez Mills. Um, and it's a really great experience. We mostly um, keep in touch by email. And um, there's a wonderful feeling of being able to ask just about anything. Um, and as you said, Phil, it, it's um, very fortunate that she herself is a translator. Um, and it's interesting um, how we get into um, questions of translation and we're able to each see what our own strengths are, what is easier for me to translate, harder for her to render in English and easier for me to say, oh, I know what you mean. And then other things where, um, because I'm not a native speaker of Spanish, um, I may see um, a phrase that's not that uncommon but is unfamiliar to me and I, you know, I, I do a corpus search and try to find out what's, you know, um, what, what exactly does this mean? And I may have limited results, whereas, of course, she can just tell me, well, it's, it's this. There you go. <laughs> um, I'm actually also interested in other forms of collaborative translation, though. And one of the ones that um, I came across um, quite recently, um, I guess you could say it's what um, the Argentinian poet Lila Semborain called collaboration with myself, uh, self-translation. Um, probably something that would give most of us pause, you know, um, translating one's own work. But I've been um, editing a special issue of a literary journal 
for which um, it's an issue that's collaboratively curated. So each um, writer that I invited to contribute to the issue also invited one other writer of their choosing. And we have interesting scenarios where one of the poets um, is translating another one of the poets in that issue and is also translating his own work. And in fact, several of the poets in the issue are translating their own work. And I became fascinated by, um, this sort of goes back to my earlier comment about what's difficult, what's, what's easy. I was fascinated by um, what things are more difficult for a writer to translate in their own work and also um, what might be easier. I am starting to get this feeling that well, it's certainly true, and this is one of the reasons why we're cautioned uh, not to translate our own work, maybe, that it's, a, um, it's just a much smoother experience to translate into um, one's own first language um, for those people who would say that they have one first language. Um, I would say that there's some kind of richness or interest or complication that I really enjoy um, because the writer of the piece knows something about the piece that no one else does. Um, but of course this is kind of a conundrum because there's also certainly the reality that the readers of the piece know something about the piece that the writer doesn't. Um, so I became very interested in that. Um, other ideas that engage me with collaborative translation are chain link translations, taking one work and translating it into another language and then another language and another language. We did this at the Poetry Center when we asked for poets to translate each other's work um, into um, their first languages. And in, in some cases, one of the poets translated the work out of her first language and into her second language. And then another poet translated that work out of um, uh, the, the poet's second language into his own um, second language. So um, fascinating to me um, in the way that was discussed in the first panel with uh, the Islamic text, which had traveled throughout the years. You can actually travel um, in really a very, very long way, even um, just in a group of three people like this talking together. Um, I think one, one very uh, lovely concept that came from Mary Louise Pratt and some other uh, theorists is the traffic and meaning. And these chain link uh, translations, traffic and meaning, they move meaning from one place to another. Um, and I think one thing that I've noticed is, is that uh, over the past 20 years, platforms like Google and uh, you know, my, Microsoft's global or Go global um, platform, they now do automatic translating for most, for most products, for most software um, items, uh, texts in the broadest sense. And they've really kind of taken that, that, uh, that responsibility away from what used to be the university and diplomatic sphere and, um, uh, and vernacular practices of translation. So I, I'm kind of curious what, um, whether we're also talking about a kind of ethics around translation. Is, does translation embody a certain kind of ethics? Maybe translation practice in some senses is the new critical thinking of which we talked about so much in the 1990s. You know, what, would it, what would it mean to uh, frame curricula or, or uh, university units around translation as a practice? I think the reason why this, I've been thinking about this is this morning at our literary master class, it was pointed out that you can, you, as a translator, you do not have a, the option not to translate something. You can't skip over anything. You can't take a holiday. You know, nothing is allowed to be translatable if you're a tra uh, it is allowed to be non-translatable if you're a translator, and that practice of having to make a decision, um, as part of the both the craft and the uh, the responsibility of being a translator, I think could be generalized into a lot of different educational spheres. Um, so. Is there a kind of ethical core to your own translation practice? I don't know. I just jumped into this panel, so I, it's, I'm making. Up I, the I was thinking of the translator as editor also. 
um, because then the editor has to make certain choices. A lot of the texts that I work with, uh, let me put it this way, Japanese editors don't edit the same way as American editors do. They're very light in editing, especially with famous writers, because famous writers in Japan do not publish with one publisher, as they do here. You know, it's a big deal here when a, pub when a famous novelist changes publishing companies. But in Japan, like Murakami, regularly publishes with four different publishers. So in order to get in line and get their, get their book in time from him, they sort of treat him with kid gloves, I guess you'd say, and that probably goes for any, any writer. Um, so what you end up with is a book that the author, author has edited, but the editor has perhaps only lightly edited, according to our standards. So when the book is, the text is brought here and given to the translator, I don't know if you'd say ethical choices, but you find certain things going on in there that need to be addressed. And for example, many books in Japan are serialized. And when they're in magazines every month, let's say, or a weekly magazine, there's a lot of repetition. You know, you forgot who that guy was from last month, right? So let me tell you again. And uh, when that's collected into one volume as a single novel, uh, a lot of times that's not always edited out. And then we get it, and the editors here think it's rather strange. They certainly don't want the translator to be to hand them something as is. So you have an ethical choice there of actually editing and, and maybe you said we, had to et we have to translate everything. Well, sometimes we have to cut or consider cutting certain things because we know they're just, they don't work in our system of telling stories. Uh, but in Japan, it's, it's fine, it's accepted. And so the, that kind of, I don't know if it's an ethical choice, but, and then also confronting mistakes in the original. Um, I don't know about mistakes in poetry, but factual errors in, in long novels, uh, we find this fairly, fairly often. And um, what do you do with that? Uh, one time, I remember with Murakami, he had his character say uh, the equivalent in Japanese of, I, I think, therefore I am. And didn't Pascal say that? And I said, well, I don't know philosophy, but wasn't that Descartes? And he said, oh yeah, I think you're right. And so I said, well, I'm changing it in the English. And uh, he said, well, thank you for pointing that, that out. And then when it was, was republished in Japan, it still said Pascal. And so there's a, you know, those kind of things. There's what do, you, what do you do when you confront an error in the original? Um, I mean, there are gonna be errors in our translations if you do a long work, but if you confront one there, how do you, you know, do you translate it as is and make the author look a little, open him to the risk of, of looking wrong or silly? I don't know if that's ethical decision, but so translation plus, translator plus being an editor at the same time is something that I have to work with a lot. Phil, to, to what extent is that um, editing responsibility uh, formalized, if at all? Is it something that um, you negotiate with a publisher when you're preparing to translate a book, or is it kind of unspoken? Um, or does it happen sometimes after you've um, produced a first draft and then you communicate with the editor it's and the necessity more, arises? Well, first I communicate with the author to make sure that, um, that, that the author is aware. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to give you the impression that these books are riddled with mistakes, mm -hmm. but especially that issue of, of overly repetitive things in serialized novels uh, really needs to, be, needs to be addressed. And the editors here are very heavy handed sometimes. Uh, they they want to switch. I mean, in one book of mine, which is still sitting at the publisher, uh, because the editor and the author got in a fight, um, the editor wanted to literally take like chapter three and make it chapter two and chapter two and make it chapter three. She said, the chronology doesn't work here. And I said, well, you know, this one, the equivalent of the Pulitzer Prize in Japan, I think it worked for somebody. And, um, but they didn't buy it. And so it's still sitting there uh, about two years after, after I finished it. And um, yeah, I, I don't know, the, the, the collaborative, uh, we're, we're sort of in the middle, I feel, you probably feel that too, between the author and, and your publisher or your editor. 
and um, we're, we're sort of the one who often is called upon to see both sides and negotiate two different viewpoints um, that, that is sometimes mutually exclusive. But um, it leads to some interesting things. It's, it's sad when books are published or are translated and just sit there. Short stories I can live with, but you know, a, a year-long project <laughs> to have the book just, just kind of sit on the shelf is, is kind of sad. Do, do you ever hear about the second generation translations? Have you ever heard of, of that? Um, where they take an English translation and translate it, like Japanese into English, and then English into another language, but based on the English version? That, that happened to me. Um, well, I didn't even know it was happening. It was in German, and, and a, the first novel of Murakami's I translated, South of the Border, West of the Sun, the German edition was apparently translated from my English version, which doesn't make any sense. There are lots of German scholars who can translate Japanese. But that's what happened. I had no idea. I suddenly got this flurry of emails from, from German scholars and grad students saying, do you approve of this? Do you think this is a good idea? And I guess that's kind of an ethical issue too. And I said, I had no idea if they were, they were doing that, and no, I don't approve of it. It's something that sounds like would happen in the 19th century, but not in the 20th or 21st century. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to go back to finding mistakes in, or supposed mistakes in the original text because, I mean, it is true that I work mostly with uh, living poets, but the main experimental moment in Italy was during the 60s, and now some of them, some of those poets are not anymore with us. And also in that period, there was a, like a, a, an opposition toward the establishment. So many books uh, were self-published at the very end and uh, not curated very well. So I mean, sometimes you find a lot of typos in those. Uh, but on the other hand, you are dealing with the, uh, with the poets uh, that are interested in experimenting with language. So sometimes you find yourself in front of a world in which there is just a vowel that change to give uh, maybe a different meaning, but wanting to maintain at the same time the word that is there. And uh, at that point, it is uh, uh, something that you have to make a decision about uh, what the poet wanted to do. And I don't know, in uh, translating this kind of poetry, I mean, with poetry, I think it's pretty easy. At the very end, I mean, you can end up uh, adding a note uh, explaining what the problem was uh, and what was the decision of the translator and leave it open for anybody who is reading to um, make uh, their own decision about that. I also uh, think about ethics a lot um, and I think part of that just comes from the fact of being a um, U.S. poet living in Tucson, translating the work of a Mexican author. Um, it's just there right from the start um, in um, everything that I do. Um, but I also think about ethics in the sense of the way that poetry is, um, it's really context rich and context differs from culture to culture, from place to place, and even though the U.S. and Mexico were right next to each other, we share, um, but obviously there's a lot of differences in our context, especially um, Tucson to Mexico City, and so um, there are you know, maybe expressions that um, are uh, reading one way in the original that I think, okay, how, how can I make this work in a translation so that it will um, give the right feeling and be true to the original, but it will also fit the context of a poem um, written by, or rather read by, um, 
an English uh, speaking audience in the US. How can I make it fit? And there's this whole idea of, well, is it good to leave it just as it was because this is how it was written and even if this might strike someone as strange or off or different, well that difference is really all part of what we want to do. Or since this is a contemporary poet, a living poet um, whose work will be read by her peers, her contemporaries, other um, poets who hopefully will be influenced by her work, is it better to um, produce that work um, so that it fits better um, the context in which it will be read. Um, one of the things that I think is um, kind of funny is that um, in this book of translations that I'm working on for Contra Corriente, um, I told you it's about a river. It is really rich in symbolism, and a lot of the symbolism um, involves animals. Um, so it's really not um, all that often that you read a um, contemporary poem by a person in the US that has roosters in it. You know, it's like rooster is just not a commonly used word in contemporary US poetry. Um, don't know why, but it's not. And so when, you know, the poems are populated by roosters and mules and cows, um, in addition to plastic bags floating down the river and um, little bits of trash and oil floating on the surface of the water. Um, so you, you're like, OK, well, this is going to maybe strike US readers as strange. Not so much us, maybe, because we're familiar with the contrasts that are present in urban life in Mexico, where you may be living in the biggest city, Mexico City, and yet um, someone you know, in a neighborhood nearby keeps cows or has a lot of chickens. And so what I think about f what is funny about that is I know that um, that's actually changing because a lot of people, including myself, now keep chickens. And um, you know, you've probably seen, if you ever walk in the Sam Hughes neighborhood, you've seen um, someone walking their goats maybe. You know, th these things are kind of changing over time. And so sometimes I just say, well, all right, this is difficult, but it's going to work itself out, you know, as um, our place, as our context changes, um, you know, maybe it's just, maybe I'm overthinking this. Um, maybe I should just let things be, let them flow, as it were. I feel a little bit remiss that we haven't asked you to uh, ring in on any of these questions. Does anybody have a response? Yes, I see a hand. I'll walk over to this gentleman with the microphone. Uh, thank you. Um, I actually have a couple of questions regarding some of the ethical issues you brought up. Um, now, you mentioned that uh, some Japanese novels are published first in serialized versions, um, and then they, of course, amplify the narrative with character descriptions to remind the reader. I, may I assume that when they are those novels in subsequent Published as a one volume? Or they're, they're subsequently published as one volume. And, and when they are, wouldn't the author also edit those passages out? You would think so. <laughs> but um, I, I find still the, I mean, usually I, I get it when uh, it's in one volume. So I, I don't really go back and compare the serialized often with that. Sometimes if I get the original galley proofs, I can see. But, um, I, I just think that there's probably um, more editing that needs to be done before it reaches our shores. I mean, to be acceptable, I'm, I'm starting to, you know, with quite a few years of experience to know or anticipate what the editors here are going to say and, and think. And I know that when they see those kind of things, they're not going to say, oh, that's a, that's a very interesting, you know, uh, process that the Japanese go through of, of not editing those out and, 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 you know, let's leave that in. They're never going to say that. You know, they have pretty, pretty strict rules and they, like I said, they're pretty heavy handed in their editorial approach. One yeah. other thing I wanted to ask, this had to do uh, with the, uh, your little example of attributing the quote, uh, I think that I am a star. Mm -hmm. In a work of fiction, <laughs> Yeah, 
the, the first novel that I translate of his is called South of the Border, West of the Sun. And very big part of this novel was a uh, vinyl recording of Nat King Cole singing South of the Border. And first of all, all many Japanese readers wrote to Murakami, who was a big jazz guy. And they said, uh, excuse me, Nat King Cole never recorded South of the Border. And he said, I asked him about this too when I was translating, he said, it, it's fiction, you know? I know he didn't do this, but that's just part of the story. So yeah, you have those elements. I think that's when you need to communicate with the author and see what the intention, what the intention was. So certainly in a book like that, I would not, I would not change it. You know. Thank you. I have a question for the thing. I was interesting, in, interested when you said that you translate from English to Italian and vice versa. There was a time, I don't know if that is still true, uh, where you were not allowed to translate from a language into a language that was not yours. Um, those were the regulations of the UN when I was you know, working as a translator in my former life. <laughs> you know, that you were not allowed to do that. And I thought at the time that it was a question of you know, regulating the translation for questions of power. Mm -hmm. And I want you to you know, tell me what you think about that. Do you want to know about my experience? Or what? Yeah, yeah. Because the, the, the claim was that you could translate best mm -hmm. by translating from a foreign language into your own native language. Mm -hmm. So do you find? I, I find that I, I, I the, does my microphone work now? or <laughs> I'm coming. Well, I think that, uh, I mean, as I said before, uh, I, I am definitely much more comfortable in uh, translating from uh, English into my own uh, language. It comes easy. I can work very well with the, the, the traditional structure of Italian poetry, with the, um, with the nuances of the language. When I do vice versa, I mean, uh, I have some of it, but no matter what, I mean, every time I have published something that is a translation from Italian into English, I either publish the translation with somebody on my side working uh, together to the translation, or at least having somebody that I trust, most of the time a poet, most of the time somebody who also speaks Italian, to check that uh, uh, everything I was doing was uh, the right way to do it. So, do you, is there such a thing as a complete, you know, bilingual person or trilingual? You know, is it possible to be at ease in two different? I think I think it is. I think it is. I've known. Uh, I mean, I've known a translator uh, that uh, uh, are totally bilingual. That actually write poetry both in Italian and in English. But I know that these people, no matter what, when they do not write in their own uh, on their primary language, they will. Uh, I mean, these people I know will go back to a native tongue to ask if everything is fine. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe there are uh, people who feel uh, totally comfortable if we go into publishing without having anybody to consult their work. Not in my experience, though. If I could just add to that, I think there is um, an important trade-off that maybe we don't recognize when we talk about the importance of translating into, and I say we, I don't mean that I talk about this, but the importance of translating into one's, you know, first language or primary language. And I think that we, you know, as a whole, just as Irene said, this is something that's talked about and 
often is accepted as a truism, right? But, you know, one advantage that we have um, if we're translating out of our primary language, translating a text that is in our primary language um, into another language, is that we are better readers of that text. And um, that's not always taken into account. I think it's maybe more taken into account with interpretation, um, particularly forms of interpretation in which accurate understanding of the um, source message is just essential as in legal interpretation. But the same you could say for literary translation too, that um, I know for myself, um, when I am reading Spanish and translating into English, I can do maybe a better job um, in the text that I produce, but I do have much more difficulty um, being absolutely 100% sure that I understand everything that I'm reading. Of course, it's poetry, so who could really say? <laughs> but I think this kind of goes to the core of the issue. I mean, this, I, some of the uh, I've I found recently some of the most uh, vigorous thinkers about translation are those who translate into their non, into their second or third language, or as uh, Aron Aji spoke of this morning, translating into English as a second language. That you can do that as well. That that's a, a possibility. Um, and you know, I, in, in my own translation class yesterday, we translated a Langston Hughes poem, "Mother to Son," into German. Um, most of the class are non-native speakers of uh, German or non-heritage uh, speakers. And the, the decision-making, the emotional kind of affective practice that is involved in translating a, a text like that with its dialect, with its oral quality, um, it requires of a, of a non-native speaker of that uh, host language a, 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 a great deal of um, Fortitude, I would call it, uh, and I, I'm wondering uh, whether we will hear a little bit more about that.